Welcome to episode 359 of the AMPM podcast. This week I'm speaking with Mina Elias. We talk about his journey from Egypt to the United States to launching a seven figure supplement brand to starting one of the bigger PPC agencies in the industry. It's a great episode. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the AMPM podcast. Welcome to the AMPM podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast where money never sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host Kevin King. Kevin King. What's up, Mina? Welcome to the AM PM podcast. How is it going? Amazing. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I mean, it's, uh, I feel like I've, it's been a long time coming and, you know, I've seen you talk to you many times. And I'm like, when are we going to do this podcast? So I'm very, very excited to be on. I'm, I'm happy to have you here too. I mean, you're one of the top guys when it comes to PPC out there. We'll talk about some of that and talk about what's working and everything in the space now. But first I want to, I want to just, I got to go back a little bit. Give me a little bit about your background. What, what, what's the story? What's the story behind, behind yeah, you? Yeah. So the, the story is I came to America 2011. I was born in Egypt and grew up in Dubai. And I came to America to get an education, uh, you know, get good grades and get a good job, that kind of stuff. I got my bachelor's in, in chemical engineering and my master's in industrial engineering. Uh, and I worked up the corporate ladder. And I was a very good engineer, you know, loved, loved what I didn't love what I was doing, but, uh, you know, loved engineering and, and um, you know, worked up the corporate ladder. And after five years of doing that, I realized that I was just sick and tired of being, you know, essentially like a modern day slave. Uh, you know, you kind of wake up, you have to show up to work, you have to do your job. You like, I don't know, you just feel like, um, I felt like I was in prison, but not really, you know what I mean? Like I could, I had, I was so much in debt because of college and I was, I just was always like not happy. Like initially the first like month, two, three, four of a job, it was very like awesome and, and exciting. And then after that, it was just like, it's the same thing day in and day out. And so, um, at that time I was training MMA. So, so I graduated from college in 2014, but in 2013, I started MMA and, you know, started fighting and everything. Uh, you know, you know, it was a very competitive and to this day, I still train. And, um, in, 2018 when I was kind of like in my maybe like it was my final job but it was like my third or fourth job as an engineering um I was like you know why am I why do I keep doing this it's like the the quote which is like if you keep doing the same thing but expect a different outcome that's the definition of insanity and I was like do I expect that my next engineering job is actually going to bring me happiness and that's when I decided like maybe I should look into supplements because I am a huge uh fan of supplements. So ever since I was like 10 or 12 years old, I've been obsessed with supplements, been, been obsessed with like looking, you know, big and strong and that kind of stuff. And just had like some weird, uh, attraction to supplements. And it was, I was on vacation with my parents in Egypt. Um, and my dad was asking me like, why don't you start your own supplement brand? This kind of question stemmed from the fact that I'm always buying so many different supplements, mixing them at home, you know, to kind of supercharge my supplements. And he's like, why don't you start your own? And that was the question that, that got me into this whole thing. And it was, it was like this perfect like uh, explosion, like, right? Because it was a combination of me uh, really, really like sick and tired of this corporate, you know, world and wanting to get out and then, you know, loving supplements and, and just the right time. Right. And um, I'm like, yeah, like, let me look into it. And I looked into it and, and decided to start um, an electrolyte supplement because I needed electrolytes as, a, as an MMA fighter, like sweating like crazy. Um, so decided to start the, decided to create the supplement and failed miserably at getting it anywhere sold, right? Any stores, stores wouldn't accept it. Gyms wouldn't accept it because they didn't have a point of sale. Um, and I'm like, why am I even trying when I buy all of my supplements on Amazon? And so Amazon was the, that next step. I'm like, let me see if I can figure this thing out. I called Amazon seller central. I, I don't even know how I got their number, but someone from seller central picked up or, or connected me or something. And then they sent me an email with instructions on how to get a, a seller central account. I got an account, forged my certificate of analysis and my, uh, invoice <laughs> from my manufacturer. Um, and then after like four rejections, they finally ungated me and allowed me to sell supplements 
Um, and, and that's it. Then, then I'm like, all right, I'm going to send my first batch in. I sent a hundred units in and then the rest is history. That was 2018. 2018, no, November of 2018. So you didn't do any courses or anything. You didn't like watch watch YouTube videos or take any course. You just somehow got in touch with Amazon. They said, "Here's how you set up an account," and you just set up an account and launched, basically, yeah, not it, knowing, it, it, just doing it blindly. Yeah, it was basically. Um, it was not until I got my Amazon account and it was ungated that then I said, "Okay, how does this work?" Like, because I thought I'm like, okay, you're going to open up on Amazon. There's going to be some sort of instructions. There was no instructions and I couldn't get a hold of anyone. So that's when, so I got my account open approximately November, like fifth or sixth. Um, and then I was live on Amazon, November 22nd. So between November 5th to November 22nd, I've, con I consumed every single YouTube video out there. I didn't buy any course because I was, um, I, I was too afraid to, to spend money. I mean, I, I was, I only had like a couple thousand dollars in my bank account um, at the time. You know, I was living paycheck to paycheck, even on an engineering salary. Like I was making, you know, 75,000 a year. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just, I was too afraid to spend 2,000, 3,000 uh, dollars on a course and then realize that, you know, I, you know how it is. Like back then, you, it, I didn't really realize the power of like paying for, for knowledge. So I had to figure everything out myself and I, I did it all the hard way by making a lot of mistakes. So this is 2018. When did things start really taking off for you? Because you eventually grew that to what, seven figures in sales, right? Yeah, yeah. So 2018, uh, November, I got live on Amazon. And, that, and uh, what I did was every single day, I texted uh, you know people uh, that are friends. And I, I had a lot of friends in Connecticut. So I would text like three to five people and offer for them to buy the product. Uh, for free. Like I would Venmo them, they would buy it. And then I would ask them for a review because they're my friend. Like they wanted to support me. And so I did that. And then at the same time, I was spending like a hundred to $200 a day on, on PVC. But the good thing was, you know, I had a one X ROAS or 1.5 X ROAS. So in my mind, I wasn't losing any money. And, um, by I think April. So, cause I remember end of April, I got fired from my job. And at that time, I was doing twenty thousand dollars a month in revenue and uh, about four thousand uh, dollars, three or four thousand dollars a month in profit. Um, and then I went to eat, like uh, I, I was fired, and I was like, okay, I don't have an income. I'm gonna go all in on my business, but my business income can't support me. So I moved to Egypt for four months where I was living out with my grandma and and uh, my parents lived there too. And I was living on five hundred dollars a month as bills and to reinvest everything back in the business. And then by this is twenty. This is summer of twenty nineteen, basically twenty nineteen. And and so uh, in I remember like I I had gone to Egypt and I was doing twenty thousand. And then I cracked like the code on on uh, getting reviews, <laughs> basically by downloading uh, the addresses of people, uh, their names and addresses, uploading them as a custom list to Facebook uh, as an audience, and then uh, sending like the, doing this like uh, ad that says uh, free bottle offer. Uh, and then, you know, many chat flow and I would get, basically they would respond to me and I, I would have my VA run them through, like leave a review and we'll send you a, a free bottle. And, um, you know, the, basically I went from a four star to four and a half star and my uh, revenue went from like 23,000 to 35,000. And then, uh, that was around like August and, uh, or so. And then September, October rolls around. And by then I was maybe in, doing 40,000 with about eight to ten thousand dollars a month in profits, and that's when I moved back to uh, LA. And then when I moved to LA, I started learning more and more because I was in a much. I think by then I was like more involved with like people like you and and other people, and uh, I learned a lot. I watched Freedom Ticket, all this stuff around September and. January of 2020, uh, COVID hit, uh, or, or right before COVID, I was doing $94,000 a month in, in revenue. And then COVID hit and my revenue uh, went even higher. And that kind of sustained throughout COVID. And then I ran out of stock. And uh, But that was around the time that things like really took off. And um, yeah, I mean, it was after a lot of like testing and understanding how PPC worked. And, um, you know, just consistently getting reviews over the course of a uh, like a, what is it now? Like a year, a year, a year, and, and maybe some change. I mean, supplements are considered one of the hardest categories to compete in. So what, what do you could attribute to your success? Was it the right time, right place? Is it the cheap price? 
Was it getting all your friends to get the reviews, to get the momentum? But how, how did you crack that to actually differentiate and, and start doing six figures a month? Yeah. So I had the lowest price, the highest number of servings. Um, I, I kept getting consistent reviews. And then uh, with my PPC, I targeted uh, long tail search terms. So instead of going like I, I was targeting the broad, but then when I realized, like I started looking at the search term reports every single uh, week and noticing that I was converting better on the long tail uh, search terms, I started launching way more. Like I would do Cerebro on all the supplements out there and would find all of like the lower search volume, sorry, all of the lower search volume keywords. And I started targeting those. And then I started spending more, like more percent of my budget on those versus um, the, the like short tail, like electrolyte supplement, electrolyte powder, hydration powder. And that I think was, was a, like a huge part of it because all of my competitors then weren't really targeting uh, long tail keywords because I would go and look and open the search pages of those long tail keywords and maybe like the top three or four competitors were there, but that's it. Everyone else was kind of like random uh, and I was better than them. I had like a thousand reviews. So uh, once I started doing that, maybe I got one sale from each of those keywords, but I added so many that it really uh, accumulated. So are you still selling this product today? Yeah, still active. It's, if you type in MMA Nutrition, uh, it's I rebranded it to Hard Work, so H R D W R K uh, Electrolytes. But if you type it in, you'll see it. I have uh, an unflavored uh, sh- uh, blue ras and a mango pineapple. There's just two SKUs in the basically three, three SKUs. Three SKUs, <clears throat> and yeah, they're doing SKUs. and doing seven figures a year on three yeah. SKUs. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, it, it was. Now it's down it's to probably like seventy thousand a month in revenue. Well, but, but is that just competitions come in or just because you've gotten busy with some other stuff and it's, it's not the, it's not the only focus that you're on, focusing on right now? Yeah, I think, uh, competition is insane. Uh, it, like, uh, competition in the electrolyte space has really, really, really become tough. So that's a big part of it. Uh, the second part of it is, uh, you know, after like putting a lot of energy into it and then I had Trivium, which is my Amazon ads agency, and that really became like a huge success. I decided I was no longer because one of my biggest, um, you know, kind of downfalls in, in, in since I started entrepreneurship was I had like shiny object syndrome and I, I started MMA nutrition. And then I started another women's supplement brand that I, you know, sold, didn't sell it for that much, but it was a distraction. And then I started this and I started that and, you know, did neuro, which was a case study on, uh, uh, you know, coffee alternative. So I did all of these things and it, I, I never really, uh, felt like I had great success in one of them. You know, some people are like, oh, like, you know, seven figures is great success. But I, now that I'm fully 100% all in on Trivium, I know like the potential of, of what great success I can have. And so that's when I decided I'm going to cut down all of my ads to like a very minimal amount of spend, not put any more energy into it and then focus on um, just building Trivium. And so when I did that, uh, the revenue dropped, but I mean, it's very profitable now. It does about like 20000 a month in profit. And I keep that as cash. Uh, it's very, you know, minimal time and energy invested. And I have a team that runs it and everything. To get it to the next level really needs a lot of attention that I don't want to give it. I, I want to stay focused on the agency and, and building that up and uh, not on the brand. So were you an entrepreneur back in the UAE when you were growing up or, or this is something fairly new to you? Very new. I, I never was an entrepreneur. The most uh, that I got in terms of entrepreneurship was once in like fifth or sixth grade, I b- uh, bought jawbreakers from Egypt and I sold them in Dubai for like five times the price because they didn't have any jawbreakers in Dubai. But it was popular because you would see them like on uh, US and Canadian like shows and, and uh, cartoons. And then the second time I was exposed to entrepreneurship was when I was uh, basically testing, uh, solving uh, homeworks and, and uh, exams for students, like take home tests and, and uh, homeworks for students in college for engineering. And they would pay me like $100, $150 per homework or per exam to like solve it. So they would send me the test, I would solve it, send it back to them, and they would get like, uh, you know, 95% out of 100. Uh, but, you know, that that's the only thing that I did in terms of entrepreneurship. I don't know if that's considered entrepreneurship, but I always thought entrepreneurship was like not smart. It was, uh, you know, you're kind of like doing random things. And I, I never really understood like that. It's actually like building businesses. And I always thought that the right way was 
being like an engineer, doctor, lawyer, I was very like stuck in my ways, like very bad uh, mindset. And so as I was an engineer, like I had some friends do like some side stuff like uh, online, like uh, one of them like th- does print on demand and, and whatever. So he did some drop shipping too. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing with your life? Like you should get a real job. That, like that was me. I was that guy. So in, in Dubai, uh, your dad, you said your dad actually recommended that you actually start this the supplement brand, but you said that you always thought that entrepreneurship growing up was maybe not, was too risky. Was your dad an entrepreneur or, or why would he, or what was, what was it? Yeah. What I, was I think that like? the, my, my dad is the, the perfect example of a entrepreneur. And I think that's the reason that I had my, that, those thoughts. Um, he basically had a really good job and was making very good income. And then he, his division, basically his branch shut down. And then he decided like, instead of going back to another job, uh, you know, and working up the ladder, which, which by the way, before that we were very comfortable. And then after that, he decided to start doing like entrepreneurship stuff and he would try and do deals and like, you know, do, do all, all of these like, you know, gigs that entrepreneurship stuff and all of them failed, nothing ever made money. And we struggled very much financially because of it. And so probably like deep down, um, uh, that, that was like the reason that I never did it was because um, I probably had this like uh, subconscious kind of feeling of stable job means good income means, you know, happy and, and uh, you know, we're, we're comfortable financially. Entrepreneurship is like risky, crazy, doesn't ever work. And that's probably where I got my definition. Uh, and, and that's why. So you went to English language schools in, in Dubai or Arabic yeah. or, or what? English. I went to an international school. Uh, it's called Shoifat. Uh, it's an, it's like, they have them all over the world. And, uh, you know, it's pretty good because I was able over there to do my SATs, SAT twos, my AP tests. I also did like the British system, which was the O levels and A levels. So I took all the tests possible and I, I, um, qualified, like I, I got amazing grades, uh, in everything. And I actually got accepted into a lot of, uh, top tier universities here, like Stanford, Princeton, uh, in Canada, McGill, Toronto, and Australia, like some couple other ones. I chose to go to Canada because, uh, you know, I, I thought like it was the kind of the third best chemical engineering uh, d- program in the world in Toronto, uh, University of Toronto. And a lot of friends were there, but my uh, student visa got rejected. Uh, and so when I found that out, it was in August and schools were starting in August. I called all the Ivy League schools. They said, I'm sorry, you didn't accept uh, your offer. So as a result, like you can't, you have to wait a year and reapply and maybe you'll get in. Um, And so I ended up like having to spend a semester back in Dubai in college. I thought my life was over. But then when I called uh, the university in Connecticut, University of New Haven, uh, they said, yeah, we'll take, uh, you know, your transfer credits, whatever. All the other schools rejected me. They're the only ones that accepted me. Um, or I mean, I didn't try that hard. Right. But, but I didn't know much. I was like 18 and, and kind of like stupid really. And so I was just very desperate and I ended up, um, you know, moving to, uh, Connecticut, New Haven, which I, I mean, thinking back, so t- two, two feelings about it, right. Thinking back, it was a horrible move because Connecticut sucks, boring, uh, not a, not a great school. <laughs> no, nothing about it was smart, but I think the, the massive amount of pain and struggle that I, uh, went through and, and suffered over there, uh, being alone, not having anyone, constantly being cold, uh, you know, hating uh, my jobs, all of this stuff. I think that was like the the pressure that was required to kind of create a diamond, right? And it was, it, it helped me build a lot of like mental strength and, and grit. And uh, it was really like, if I, if I worked at Helium 10 uh, in, in Irvine, I, probably I would have never been an entrepreneur. I mean, th- those guys have it really great right there you're chilling you show up to an office everyone's nice they you know you do all these fun things uh there's a great culture um if i was in a company like that i, pro- I probably would just been happy and and worked up the ladder and and you know been satisfied and content uh but it was because i hated my life so much uh in corporate uh, that i like i was like corporate's a scam i hate corporate corporate's the worst thing ever and it, it really is what forced me to become an like realize that i was born to be an entrepreneur and eventually become an entrepreneur and you re- you've actually recently you recently took your parents to Hawaii, I think, and I think I heard you say somewhere you told me at some event or something that you actually retired them as well. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, they're fully retired. They they make like a, an incredible salary, uh, and they have a. I, they, I pay pay for them to have a country club membership. 
and uh, bought them a car. Like they never have to work another day in their life. This is in Egypt. They're this back in, in Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. They're, they're, what, so they're coming, in Cairo or where in Egypt? Uh, th yeah, they, they live in Cairo uh, and, and um, uh, they, they came and they stayed with me in America for two months. So they, I put them in an apartment in Santa Monica, got them a gym membership, uh, took them to Hawaii <laughs> for two weeks. Yeah, like, I mean, it, it's great. I, I spoil them. They got me to where I was, right? Like from zero to 18. And so I'm like, you know, as a thank you, the, you get to like chill for the rest of your life. That's cool. That, that's cool. So wh how would you say that chemical engineering actually prepared you for what you're doing now? I mean, because the, the, the thought processes of, of the mathematical and the, the figuring out systems and the science behind it, that's a lot of what Amazon is. And a lot of people always say, what's one of the keys to success on Amazon? And you, you got you to have a good product. You got to have a differentiation. There's all this, the standard answers that everybody all, get good reviews, you know, the standard answers that everybody always knows. But I think there's actually another edge to it. And I think someone you, that comes from an engineering background has an advantage. Um, would you say that, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I, I completely agree. I think being an engineer uh, like gives me a very structured and, and systems way of thinking. Um, I'm also a, a problem solver, uh, like a, a very good problem solver. That's basically engineers are born to solve problems. Um, it's also, I mean, on Amazon, uh, and this is something that I, I talk about all the time. Uh, I talked about it, at, you know, probably uh, any, like my, my billion dollar seller summit, uh, the virtual one, that presentation, talked about it at seller summit, uh, Stephen Chu's presentation. But basically you have a few metrics that you're tracking. You have sessions, which is the number of people coming to your listing and that's your traffic. And then you have your click through rate, which is based on the number of people that see your ads, a certain percentage of them click on it and, and come into your listing, convert into a session. Then you have your conversion rate, which is a certain number of those people that come into your listing convert into a sale. And you know, being an engineer, being a chemist, uh, I'm taught to, you know, you test one thing at a time and you start understanding by that change that you made, what is the outcome? And, and a lot of times in, in engineering, you have the thing that you can control, you have the final outcome and everything in between is kind of uh, like it's a black box. You don't really know. So you, you start doing all of these tests so you can start uh, like uncovering what's in, in the middle. And you're like, okay, if I change the temperature of this solution and then I add this thing, what happens? Let's try it at a 20 degrees, 50 degrees, 70 degrees, 100 degrees. Okay, let's try it at, uh, you know, this pressure and that pressure. Let's try it in this thing and that thing. And you learn to never make any assumptions. You learn to, uh, you know, always... always uh, like stress test everything. Like, okay, you're telling me like that, uh, you know, this thing is true. I'm like, how can I prove that it's not true? What are all the things that I could do to prove that it's not th uh, true? And if I try it all and it's still true, then there's a much higher chance that it's true than if I just assume that it's true. So all of these things that I learned now that I go into Amazon, I'm like, okay, what are all of the things that affect my traffic? Uh, you list them all out. I'm like, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to document my spend every day, my sessions every day. I'm going to test these different things. Maybe it's launching campaigns. Maybe it's increasing bids. Maybe it's increasing budgets. Maybe it's trying to have a campaign with 100 keywords versus five keywords. Maybe it's trying Google traffic. And then, uh, you know, it's one test at a time. Everything is documented. I'm measuring based on the change what the outcome is and, and the outcome to the metrics that matter that I can really, you know, feel, which is like revenue, spend and revenue. Those are the only two metrics that, I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt are true, right? Because spend is, is hitting your credit card, revenue is hitting your bank. And then, you know, sessions could be wrong. Your unit session percentage, you can't really tell if your sessions or unit session percentage are accurate from Amazon or not. It could be all made up, right? Because sessions is like, they could tell you that you have a thousand sessions. Maybe you only have 50 and, and your, you know, your conversion rate could, so they say it's 5%. It could be actually 25, uh, you know, you, you don't really know, uh, you, you know, same with the click through rate. They could say like you have 1.2 million impressions and, you know, 1,000 clicks. What if it's actually 600,000 impressions and, and 100 clicks? You can't really test that, right? You can't prove it. And so that like that's where um, engineering comes in is I, I start to like stress test everything and say, what can I control? What can I test? How can I not make any assumptions? And then I start to change one thing at a time and test the outcome. So with like click through rate, I'm like, I'm going to test the price and I'm going to give it a week and I'm going to wait till I see some statistical significance on the, on the click through rate data and make a decision. Then I'm like, okay, I'm going to test the main image. I'm going to do, you know, old main image versus new main image. And then I'm going to test the, you know, that new main image and see 
what's the impact on my click-through rate and conversion rate uh, you know, after a week? And is it statistically significant? And does it reflect in the revenue? Uh, and, and so on. And so that's what the engineering uh, you know, kind of taught me. Taught me to be very resourceful, uh, you know, try and figure everything out myself and, and uh, te- you know, uh, like stress test everything. Also taught me how to be very methodical. So I think one of my advantages over a lot of other people is if you come and look at my business, everything is super systemized. Everything is, you know, straight lines and, and, and everything is documented. Everything is a process. Everything is a flow. Everything has, you know, data and numbers and KPIs. And that organized way of thinking, I think, really helped. What led to going from selling the, the electrolyte supplements to actually deciding you wanted to focus on PPC? Is it because you just that... You just loved that numbers game and that that the, the game of figuring out PPC or what what or you had some good success and did people come to you and say hey can you help us out or what led you to, from going to selling the supplements as your primary focus to putting that on the, as the side hustle and making uh, Trivium your main focus? Yeah, good, great question. And so in in around like August of 2019. I'd been selling from November, so it was like about nine months, and I was in like a bunch of Facebook groups, and and I was always asking questions, always asking like, how do you do this? How do you do that? So by then, like there was a new wave of of sellers coming in, and they started asking like simple questions about PPC, uh, and PPC was the biggest thing that I focused on because. I saw a very direct correlation. Every time I spent a dollar more, I made a dollar more. Every time I spent a dollar less, I made a dollar less. So I became obsessed with PPC because I felt like besides reviews, that was the other thing that really impacted my entire business uh, in terms of revenue. And so when those people started coming in, I started answering their questions and they started looking to me as like this guide. And I I only answered in terms of experience. I said, this is what I've tried and this was the outcome. And, And, you know, that's that. I just started sharing my experience. I then decided to make a video series. I said, guys, like I see a lot of common questions that I've figured out and I'll explain everything. And then I I think I did like a 15 part series on PPC. What's an exact campaign? What's broad? What's phrase? What's auto? You know, the different types of auto campaign budgets, you know, bids, all of these things. Bulk sheet optimization, search term report. And after that, people went crazy in the Facebook group. And um, then, you know, fast forward, COVID hits in 2020, COVID hits. I'm, I'm in LA, I'm stuck in my apartment and I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to start hopping on podcasts and sharing all of this knowledge that people love. Uh, and again, I didn't have an agency, didn't have anything. So I hopped on these podcasts and I started doing like one podcast a week, which back then I mean, you're in COVID, you have so much free time, right? <laughs> so I started doing one podcast a week and I got a really big uh, personal brand in the space. And again, I, I was never... Uh, being a guru or saying I was just literally sharing my experience. I said, when I tried having 50 keywords in a campaign, I looked and I would, you know, sort by sales. And I noticed that only four of them are getting sales. So I tried pausing those ones, launching them, you know, three in each campaign. And I noticed that they started getting sales and and just sharing things like that. And, um, and I, I developed this really big personal brand. People kept hitting me up saying, can you please run my, my ads? And I said, no, like, I mean, I have my business. I'm, I'm not going to trade my time for money. That's the whole reason I got into entrepreneurship uh, for the freedom of it. And um, I didn't have a team. I didn't have anything. So I, I, I just kept turning people down. And then end of 2020 hits, Tomer uh, hits me up and he's like, uh, you know, Tomer, obviously, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. He hits me up and he's like, uh, I'm working with an aggregator. They need someone to train their PPC team. Uh, we're looking at you as like a potential candidate. Would you like to interview? I said, sure. Uh, you know, this is like kind of like a consulting gig. Um, I said, sure. Happy to do it. You know, happy to consult people. Um, I interviewed with them. They loved me. Uh, they said, write me a proposal. I gave them this proposal, a number of hours to train their team. They said, okay, but we need to test you on one of our brands to prove that you actually know what you're doing. So uh, they, te- they tested me on one of their brands. And four months later, they're like, here's you and the six other agencies that we hired and you outperformed all of them. Uh, you beat all these other agencies. We're going to hire you for this proposal. They hired me for the proposal. I started training their team. And then I, I was kind of like sitting there realizing that this they paid me to manage one of their brands. And by then I had one employee. So it was feasible for me to manage one of their brands. Uh, they paid me the same or more money than what I was making out of MMA Nutrition. And MMA Nutrition was a constant stress and struggle to keep inventory and all this stuff. And I wasn't really that good at, at being a you know brand manager. I mean, I created a supplement brand. Some people say, you know, seven figures is great. 
to me, I feel like, you know, eight figures is, is great. Seven figures is like, okay. And then it was the easiest money. Uh, I added the most amount of value. Um, and, and so I'm like, I have this massive personal brand. People keep asking me to run their stuff. I keep turning them down. I'm really good at this. Clearly I'm outperforming everyone as a supplement, as an electrolyte supplement. I'm, I don't, yeah, I mean, maybe I'm in the top 30, 40%, right. But in this PPC, clearly, like if this company raised $400 million and they found me out of everyone in the world and they gave me the contract, it says something. And um, so I said, this is probably what I'm good at. So I, I decided to take a, a few clients on, took a few clients on. Um, it went amazing. I mean, it really helped their business. One of the one of the first clients I took, we took them from zero to they do eight figures now and, and they sell a, a credit card holder. Um, and, and so I was like, maybe this is this is better. Maybe this is a better option. And I'm not married to a business. I'm not like, you know, I business is business. I'm, I'm uh, giving value to people and in exchange, they pay me money. And my goal has always been the same. It's a freedom of time, a location, uh, you know, financially free. So it seemed like the right move. And I decided I was no longer going to keep splitting my attention into all these different things. And I was going to focus on being the best in the world at one thing. And that's how I chose, uh, you know, Trivium. Well, how many uh, clients does Trivium have today? 143. And how big is the team? 73 employees. All in the U.S. or all spread out all over the world or mostly yeah, Filipino? No. or Yeah, mostly mostly in Europe. Uh, like I, I think we're like 60% in Europe. Uh, only a few people in the Philippines, uh, you know, a few people in uh, other places in the world and about 10 or 12 people in the U.S. What's that like going from just you doing everything to now you got 73 people? Did you hire someone to help hire all those people or were you involved in and putting all those people into place. Yeah, no, no. I hired a, a, a recruiter. Um, and, and so in, in house, so as it, when I was starting to hire people, um, I got my first person, uh, kind of luckily by like through an introduction, uh, built him up. Uh, he brought two of his, he brought a friend who brought a friend. Uh, then I used multiply me to bring like one person in. And so it was a very like, not structured way of like growing uh, the team. Uh, and then, you know, we, we really started feeling a lot of pain when I needed one more PPC, uh, you know, manager and no one, none of us had any referrals. Uh, I couldn't find anyone. And, um, you know, we had like, you know, 20 clients that want to work with us, but I'm like, I can't, we're at capacity. And so that's when I decided to bring an in-house recruiter, uh, we tested her and we said, you know, show proof to us that you can hire someone. She did a phenomenal job. Her communication was amazing. Uh, she got the job done. So we hired her and full time. And then her job was literally like, you know, she would post job ads everywhere that was relevant to the country that we're hiring in. And then she would collect all the resumes. She would filter through them. Anyone who passed, she would send them a test, uh, which was like basically tested them on like a few things. If they passed the test, then they would be promoted to like uh, do a, an initial interview. She would check culture fit, whatever. Uh, we used to skip and just go straight to a final interview. But I realized that after they made it to the final interview, uh, I, I started testing them and say, open up your Excel, uh, you know, spray, or here's an Excel sheet. Show me how you would do this. And then they would blank. And so we realized that some people were cheating on the test. So we started putting them through a live test. Uh, Excel test and, to, you know, an, an aptitude test, and then they would do the final interview and hiring them. And so that was the process that we used. And now it's this process, but like on steroids, like we run ads everywhere. We, you know, post everywhere, all pointing to a, a job form. People fill out that form. Anyone that gets qualified gets put into like a short list. They that again automatically get sent the test. They fill out the test that comes back. The test's reviewed. Uh, if, if they pass the test, then they're moved to an initial HR interview. Uh, and then, you know, they go through the process until, and the final interview is no longer, uh, with me. It's now with the head of the division. What, what are some key characteristics that as an agency that you're looking for when you hire someone to run PPC? Because I always say that, that, you know, people always come to me and they say, Kevin, uh, I don't want to mess with this PPC. Who, who do you recommend? What's a good agency? Should, should I use, uh, you know, one, there's, there's a laundry list of them out there and you know, a lot of the, the top people in the space. And you could bounce from one to the other. And it's, to me, it's not about the company. It's about the person that you get in that company that can make a difference. Because someone may say XYZ company is great because they had a great person in the company, but someone else can go to that same company and have a totally different experience. 
uh, that's that's not as good. So what do you do? What 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 is it that it takes to actually be a good PPC manager uh, for, on the agency level? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to answer this question uh, in two parts, right? Because I think what you said is uh, about like the person that you get is only true for small businesses. Um, and, I, and I'll explain why. So uh, who am I looking for? I'm looking for someone who is very, very strong in Excel, someone who's very calm under pressure, uh, someone who can uh, process a lot of data and information uh, quickly, uh, someone who can recognize patterns and trends, someone who has very high attention to detail, uh, someone who's resourceful and a critical thinker, um, someone who's really good with numbers. And that's mainly kind of what I'm looking for. So we usually find, uh, you know, engineers perform really, really well in that role. We don't uh, typically require anyone to have, uh, you know, experience uh, as a PPC manager. Um, they come in fresh. They have all the right qualities. We put them through a very extensive uh, you know, training. And that training is uh, basically they learn everything there is to know about the Amazon platform, you know, including uh, not only PPC, but like the factors that affect cook through rate, conversion rate, inventory management, supply chain, finances of the business. They learn everything start to finish. Who then, created the training? Who created the training? Me. I created the training. So it's like, it's actually like sit down and go through 20 hours of yeah. course like a, it's like, like an internal course or something it's an internal course and it's it's uh, it's more than yeah it's like more than 20 hours right it's uh, like at least i think 45 hours of of just video and then uh, and in every step they have to report to their manager and they they get tested and they have to answer questions to make sure that they understood what you know what they learned and then by the time they 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 finish the that information part they then move to the the middle part which i call it the boot camp and it's basically taking action uh, at like vi so many times that it becomes muscle memory or, or call it intentional uh, practice or whatever. But basically like, let's say a bulk sheet optimization, they get a bulk sheet and, and the, in the guidelines, it says, we need you to optimize, uh, you know, in, in these uh, criteria. And, and so they do it and they, you know, they do it and they submit it. And then they do that for eight hours a day. So imagine spending eight hours a day doing bulk sheet optimizations. The next day you spend eight, eight hours a day uh, launching new campaigns. Uh, you know, building like the structure and everything with the right campaign nomenclature, with the right uh, setup and everything. Then you move to like negatives, then placements. So by the end of the boot camp, they know how to do everything that they need to do in terms of actions. Uh, like they've memorized it. They can close their eyes and they can do it. Then they move to the final piece, which is the uh, of training, uh, which is basically like live on campaign manager. You get sent like, uh, or live on like Seller Central. You get sent like these tasks and you have to like, you know, do them and submit them. And it's like, you know, go and, and um, look at like their analytics and tell me their sessions and their conversion rate and then download the box you do. And then they learn how to navigate everything on Amazon. Then from there, they get promoted to becoming an assistant to an existing PPC manager. So let's say an existing PPC manager is managing an account. Uh, th their job is to basically communicate with a client and then go and look at the data, interpret the data, make, make you know, decisions, and then take action. So the PPC manager will go do everything, but then instead of taking action, they'll delegate the action taking to the person. And they'll say, hey, uh, you know, I looked at the analytics. Based on that, our spend went up. Our revenue went up slightly. I think it's time that we optimize. So go and find the keywords with, you know, with one to... 20% or sorry, uh, greater than 80% ACOS, add them as a negative, you know, lower the bids on keywords, anything that's exact and, and whatever. And they delegate that work. They do the work. They come back. They say, here you go. Everything is good. They upload it to Amazon. And so they spend time basically assisting a, a brand a PPC manager uh, and learning, you know, on the job. And then by, by the end of it, they they get like one account where they're in charge uh, and so on. So that's our process. Very, very, very intensive. Um, but, you know, by the end of it, you're really, really qualified, uh, you know, to run ads. The reason that I don't look at for people with, with the experience is because I don't know what their prior experience is. I don't know who they worked for. I don't know, uh, you know, uh, like I know who they work for. Let's say they came from any of the other agencies. I don't know what their training is like. I don't know, you know, how good it is or how bad it is. So I'd rather you know, uh, uh, build them up myself, especially because Amazon's a relatively like new industry and things are changing all the time. And then I can control it. Now, the second part of that, which is like, it depends on who you get. It only depends on who you get uh, if you don't have enough QC controls in place. 
Um, and so I don't think in the bigger companies like the, the, the you know, billion dollar corporations, it depends on who you get because they have so many checks in place that if you get person number one or person number 10, you're going to get the same result because they've gone through so much QC that you'll never get a, a, like an output or a deliverable from them without them all going through the same you know, checks and, and balances. And so with our team, what, what we've implemented is, okay, you know, how can we ensure that everyone is doing uh, everything right, right? So it's, it's um, like an internal checklist where the pod leader who sits on top of the, the strategist reviews every single day what they're doing. Have, do they communicate uh, effectively? D- did they ask the, uh, you know, the client, do you have any questions? Is anything unclear? Did they send an update that was clear? Uh, did they answer every single question? And then when it comes to like, uh, you know, the work that they do, you know, the, the work is basically like, okay, they go, they interpret the data, they say we've scaled, whatever. Um, so then we have like an internal analytics uh, tracking of how is the performance of any of the, the brands? Anything that's going up consistently, we're like, okay, great. Anything that's flat or going down immediately, you know, you, we have senior people that come in and they start looking and seeing, you know, is this actually uh, a strategist problem? Like the person, the PPC manager on the account, are they doing something, uh, you know, wrong or do they need help with the strategy or is it seasonality and the, or the conversion rate of the client went down or they, they increased the price and that didn't work or something like that. And so, because of those levels of like, uh, you know, QC, that's how, you know, you can have this guy or that guy. And it doesn't really matter because as long as any time there is any sort of trigger in like a, a performance drop, you get this, the best people in the company to come, come and take a look at it. Um, and if obviously if we notice, you know, 30% of the clients are like declining in, in performance, then it's like a, a an alarm like, hey, stop all sales we're going to focus on fixing whatever the problem is. And um, and then once we fix the problem, we can start sales back up again. So that's kind of my process. When new clients come to you, what are the three biggest things that you see them just goofing up that you're like, oh my God, here we go again. What are three things that people listening when it comes to PPC, they need to really be doing that they're not doing? Yeah. So first of all, uh, their campaign structure uh, is hurting them. Uh, they have, you know, too many keywords in a campaign. Uh, their budgets are too low. Things like that. They have multiple ad groups. All of these things are very simple fixes because, you know, basically when you have a low budget, what I've seen is uh, all you need to do is increase your budget, keep the bids the same, your performance goes up, and, and you you'll still won't spend your entire daily budget. It just Amazon sees that there's more breathing room and it allows you to perform. I don't know, but that's what we see. That's number one. Um, you know, having too many keywords in in, a, in an ad group. Uh, again, I, I notice you'll have 50 keywords in an ad group, 35, 40 uh, of them are, get zero, you know, spend sales impressions. I pause all that, launch them in their own campaigns. Immediately, we start getting more sales. And then um, multiple- each, ad- each, each, each one in its own single word campaigns or putting like two or three together or what? I would say no more than five, you know, anywhere okay. between one to five. Um, you know, obviously you don't want to do one too many times, especially for very low search volume keywords, because they're not getting that much traction anyway. So you don't want to mess up, like get it very messy in your campaign manager for keywords that are maybe going to make one sale a month or one sale every two months. Um, and then multiple ad groups, I start seeing that the ad spend starts splitting weird, uh, uh, you know, between the two, it's not consistent. Uh, and sometimes I have keywords that are more profitable, getting less ad spend than other ones that are less profitable. So keeping, so campaign structure is the, is the first thing. The second thing is, is that no clear structure in it. So in two ways, number one, like, are you cleaning up keywords that are spending money and not making sales? Uh, that's like a big thing right, right off the bat. So why, why don't we clean that up? Like every single week or every three days, depending on how much your spend is, go look at keywords that are spending money, not making sales, or go look at keywords that made one sale in the last 30 days, but have a very high ACOS. All of these can be cleaned up. And then the final thing is there's really no um, game plan. Uh, You know, so it's like you look at their ad spend and it's just all over the place, up and down, up and down, up and down. And I'm like, what was the plan here? And so our plan is very simple. You're either scaling your ads so you're launching campaigns, increasing bids, increasing budgets, 
increasing bid by placements, you know, doing taking all the action that that you want to increase your spend and increase your revenue, you know, by getting more people into the listing, or you're optimizing for profit. So you're lowering your bids, lowering your bud, not lowering budgets, lowering your bids, adding negatives, uh, lowering your bid by placement, anything that didn't work during the scaling phase, eliminating that so you're left with everything that's better uh, and, and, you know, everything that's profitable. So, you know, we work in one of those two phases and because we do that, it's very clear and we end up, you know, scaling, getting more revenue, killing the stuff that didn't work. You end up with more profit, scaling again, getting more revenue and so on. And then the final thing is, I think people come to us and they're like, you know, we expect you to do, you know, this, this, and that with PPC. And, you know, they don't realize that their conversion rate, uh, you know, the reviews and their images mainly, uh, they are like basically attached to PPC. And so if you try and increase this without this, nothing will happen. You'll just, it, it won't work, you know? And they focus too much on PPC without giving the exact same attention and energy. I'm like, I have people on your account every single day working on PPC. Do you have people on your account every single day working on getting more reviews and, and improving your you know, listing conversion rate through images or whatever? The answer is usually no. If you put an equal amount of energy into that as you do in your in your PPC, your revenue will scale you know, very, very fast. If you don't, all I'm doing is bringing more people to your listing and you know, more and more people don't want to convert because when I was bringing a hundred, if your conversion rate is 10%, I was bringing a hundred people to your listing. 90 people don't want to convert. Now I'm bringing 500 people to your listing, 400 and people, 450 people don't want to convert. So it's like, it just multiplies. It's an amplifier, basically what PPC is. What's a healthy ratio of sales generated from PPC to sales generated organically in your opinion? Okay. This is controversial. I don't think those numbers are accurate. I think the, the numbers that you see on Amazon are don't tell the truth. And, and I've tested this many times. So I can put, uh, like, let's say I have $500 in ad spend, $1,000 in sales organically, $1,000 in sales in PPC. I cut down my, uh, my ad spend, let's say from 500 to 100. You expect the PPC sales to fall. However, your PPC sales will go from 1,000 to 200. Your organic sales will go from 1,000 to 200. What's the explanation? It, it can't be organic rank because that does not tank that quickly. It doesn't tank in one day. So the only other explanation that I can think of is that the attribution is off, that we don't know what's actually PPC and what's actually organic. So as a result, I recommend you look at your spend and your total sales and you don't worry about organic or not organic because it's the, the numbers that you're going to get just aren't accurate and you can you just can, bake it in just bake it in as a tac a tacos uh, just and just assume, yeah yep, that, that's what i do yeah i just uh, that um so what's an ideal tacos in your opinion I, not 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 i know when you launch it's going to be yeah. totally different but once you've stabilized a product what what's a an ideal tacos to be shooting for yeah so i think i think um the, the way that we look at an ideal tacos is we there is a curve right and think of this curve like um, you know, it, it's a bell curve. So it goes up, peaks and goes down. And then uh, the, the peak is the highest profit that you can get. And then on the X axis, you have from 0% tacos to 100% tacos. So as your tacos goes from zero, let's say to five, seven, eight, 10, 12, at some point, it's going to hit a peak in profit. And then beyond that, it goes to 17, 18, whatever, 25, 30% tacos, the profit starts going down again. Now that peak uh, of profit, we don't know the exact number, right? So you have to test. So, uh, you know, usually uh, we see it fall between anywhere between f five and, you know, 25% tacos, right? Which, you know, 25% uh, might seem high for some people, but certain products, 25% tacos is generating uh, more profit, dollar amount in profit than 15% tacos because of the increase in sales velocity. So, you know, again, going from a 10% tacos to a 20% tacos, you spend 10% more for the sale. But what happens if you get 10 more sales? And, and you know, that, that's 10, 10 more sales is 10 times, let's say $10 in profit per unit. So you basically spent an additional dollar to get, you know, an, uh, $10 more in profit uh, per unit. And so it's obviously you know, going to be more beneficial. So that's the best way to look at it is it's a bell curve. And if you want, you can graph it out. You can go look at all of your, uh, you know, if you use a, a software that shows profit, like 
we use my real profit and it shows your ad spend, your tacos and your, your dollar amount in profit every single day. And you can map out a bell curve or you can map out a curve. And if you feel like you don't have a bell curve, then you should probably, you know, test uh, by increasing the spend in different tacos over time. And once you see that bell curve, you'll notice at what what tacos you hit the highest amount in profit. And, you know, it's different for every product, different for everyone. That's why I'm always a, a fan of just testing. Uh, you know, lower tacos doesn't always mean better because sometimes a, a little bit higher tacos could mean more sales velocity. And every additional sale is whatever, you know, anywhere between 5 to $10 more uh, in profit per unit. So um, that's, that's where you have to find like that perfect balance. Awesome. Well, Mina, I really appreciate you coming on today and sharing. Uh, we've been going uh, almost uh, almost an hour here, uh, so that's uh, I know we could keep on talking uh, uh, more and more and diving into it. But uh, you'll, we'll have to have you on the Helium Ten Elite again, uh, or maybe even on a future uh, billion dollar seller summit. You just never know. If people if people want to uh, reach out to you and uh, and find out more, or get in touch with your agency, or, or uh, just have questions, how, how would they best go about that? Yeah, so the website is triviumco.com, T-R-I-V-I-U-M-C-O.com. Uh, we offer a free audit, so it's a 35, 40-minute long video audit where we go through everything in your account and help you, you know, show you exactly what to do, give you resources, whatever. Feel free to use that. It's free. Um, you can reach out to me. My email is mina at triviumco.com. And then, uh, or Instagram is also the easiest way to get a hold of me. It's at the Mina Elias. Um, you know, can DM me, I can answer LinkedIn, Mina Elias as well. Uh, I'm on there. So that's M I N A, uh, E L I A S. Awesome. Thanks Mina. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me, Kevin. This is great. And, and, uh, can't wait to talk more PVC. I think one of the important things you can learn from my talk with Mina is to just follow your passion. You know, he started out as a MMA fighter. He still does that, but that led to him beginning a supplement brand of electrolytes and then that led him down the PPC path, and now he's got a, a very successful agency and doing really well for himself. So if you follow your passion and just keep your head down and keep working, good things are going to happen, as Mina is a perfect example of. We'll be back again next week with another episode of the AMPM podcast. Until then, i got to leave you with some words of wisdom. Always try to make an impact, not just an impression. Always try to make an impact, not just an impression. See you next week.